Um, I'm going back to prune the rain this afternoon. We, we, did, we got away with pruning in the class yesterday. It was about um, with the wind chill and the cold chill and everything else chill. <laughs> the class went from 24 to 9 over three hours. I think today the class will start with zero. I'll, I'll be checking off their grading attendance and things. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about rootstocks this morning. How do you choose them? How do, what, what sort of thought process is involved? What are the main parameters in terms of making decisions? And then in the end, you'll find out that the only really important thing is what's available at the nursery. And the, the question really is, why is that the case? Why is the nursery controlling? Why are the nurseries controlling access to these materials? And it's because some propagate better. Uh, some are easier to sell. Some are more generalist in behavior. Uh, but it almost always leads to problems when we start concentrating and not, not looking at the diversity of stocks and what might be available, but, but channeling our thought into fewer and fewer things. Uh, just like anything else, there's positive aspects about diversity and trying to get away from, from training the insects and, and uh, fungi, bacteria, uh, all those things that are in the soil, um, uh, actually accommodating them and, and having them adapt to these, these rootstocks. So that's what we want to try to avoid. So the talk today is not so much what rootstock will you use as what might be available and how, would you, how might you use those to prevent uh, eventual problems in the future. Let's see works. I always like to thank all the funding agencies. I've been well supported by the nursery industry for the last uh, 30 years almost now. Um, uh, the Table Gate Commission has been involved in that funding, funding as well. The American Vineyard Foundation, Ian J. Gallo uh, provided his postdoc for four years on salt tolerance that we've been working on. Uh, we do a lot of work on Pierce's disease. That's a separate issue entirely and I won't mention it much today as, as well. And I've had funding from the Louise Rossi Endowed Chair Fund which has really helped a lot. Um, filling up with hoarders and things we need to do. So why do we have rootstocks in the first place? Why not just plant own rooted plants? And in fact, there are still people planting own rooted plants uh, without using rootstocks around the state. Uh, if you were planting in a virgin area and you didn't have any friends, uh, you've never been in viticulture before and there was going to be no access onto your property whatsoever, it probably wouldn't be that bad an idea now. Uh, but of course, we don't have those situations. It's hard to really guarantee that they may not occur over time. Uh, but that's a common question I get in new viticultural areas is, can I get away without using a rootstock? And the answer is, it depends on how well you want to sleep at night, uh, more, than, more than anything else. It's the risk factor, again. So rootstocks came into being because of phylloxera, the great phylloxera insect. It's a root aphid. Uh, it invaded um, uh, Europe, probably through the o overly ambitious efforts of, of horticulturalists and plant collectors who were on the East Coast realizing some of these varieties were interesting. We might bring them back to Europe and see how they might perform, even in a backyard situation. And this is sort of a warning note for those, those people who get to the, um, uh, the customs inspection station at LAX or San Francisco airport, and you realize, what are all these big boxes full of fruits for? Uh, why, why are people being encouraged to throw away their plant material? For very, this is the very reason. We don't want, really want to import these new, new infects and new, uh, new pests and diseases into the state. And we have continually. Uh, the leaf roll three crisis and, and uh, vine leaf bug, all those sort of things are, are the result of, again, overly, overly zealous people who want to bring in material more quickly than we actually can accommodate. So that happened in Europe too, and this is a classic case. There's a fantastic book called uh, The Botanist and the Vintner, if you haven't read it yet. It's a, the history of the, the Phylloxera crisis by Christy Campbell, and it's fascinating. Um, and it really gives you that, uh, that view into what, what happened when Phylloxera took out the vineyards. And it did it very quickly, and it completely disrupted the economy of Europe. Uh, one of the only major benefits besides rootstocks and rootstock breeding uh, that came out of the Phylloxera crisis uh, was the advent of, of a rail, rail system. So the first effort to control Phylloxera was to kill it. And they pumped, they pumped carbon bisulfide all over the entire, entirety of Europe on a rail line that didn't exist, and it came into being because of that. And now we're still, we, we benefit from that, that rail system. It's that infrastructure that was put into place that gets people moving around Europe. So that was the positive aspect of it as well. So when did it happen? Well, we think it happened in the 1850s or so. And again, it may, the Phylloxera may have come into Kew Garden first and then gone across with, with plant collectors. Uh, it's readily mobile, both uh, aerially, it can fly, uh, and it moves primarily on plant material, on the, on the roots of plant materials. That's the way to, to move these things around very quickly. Uh, it initiated rootstock breeding, and the rootstock breeding component was the final solution, and it was the, the least favored. So the first effort was to develop hybrid direct producers. We call them the French hybrids now that, that resist phylloxera and would produce good fruit. But they didn't find that to be the case. They took vinifera, they crossed it with uh, American species, trying to increase resistance, uh, trying to maintain quality, and they didn't do either. 
uh, resistance was lowered and quality was lowered. So that didn't work out, but it had very strong support uh, and very strong political support at first. Uh, the next effort was try to kill this thing, and, and again, they pumped carbon bisulfide into the ground. In its gaseous form, it's relatively explosive. Uh, so if, if, uh, if there were probably more people lost to flocks for explosions than there were to flocks for insects. Uh, so that they tried to control this thing. And if you go to wineries, old wineries across Europe, you'll see these wonderful three-foot-tall hypodermics in all their display cases. And that's exactly how they pump this gas into the ground. Uh, again, it's very effective at killing phylloxera. Water, it turns out, kills phylloxera fairly effectively. Uh, it's not the matter of, of what is going to kill it. It's really how it, how it does it, how effectively does it get through the soil profile and penetrate. And it doesn't do it very well. All these compounds have, have failed at really controlling phylloxera through chemically. So finally, rootstocks were decided upon. And rootstocks weren't new. They'd been used in, in China for probably a 1,000 years before this. Uh, they've been used all over the horticultural world. It was a classic means of expanding plant material, and we still do that. We chip butt onto a given rootstock, and so we have one clonal material and can advance it very quickly. Uh, so it's been a long and old practice. Um, it began about the 1860s, 1870s, and, and by the 1880s and 1890s, we had really the vast majority of the rootstocks we still use today uh, produced, developed, and being utilized around the world. Uh, so it's been a long, long, long-term effort to keep these things, keep, to keep them down. Um, how do they move? They move on plant material. They move on the roots. They move to some extent on the above ground portion of the plant. They blow readily. Uh, even, even forms that don't have wings blow readily in the air. And now we have winged forms as well that, that, uh, that move more actively too. They feed on the leaves uh, and the roots of rootstocks and vinifera. And there's usually an inverse relationship between the resistance at the root level and the resistance at the leaf level. Um, Leaf phylloxera really don't cause any damage. We have them now spreading around California. We never had leaf phylloxera in California until about uh, 15 years ago. And now they spread readily throughout the state. Uh, they're on most of the plant material. The nurseries spray to control uh, their damage to the foliage of rootstocks. So they have to control. Otherwise, they lose about 20%, 30% of the cuttings potential. But it has no impact really on viticulture. So you can have leaf galls on a, on a wild species or on rootstocks, but it's not going to spread to the... To, uh, uh, to damage those other plants once they're grafted, as long as they're on resistant roots. That's the, the key aspect. There we go. Uh, so phylloxera, how do they kill the vine? They feed on the root tips, and they feed on the, roots, on the structural roots as well. There's two sorts of root feeding that goes on. Uh, the root, root tip damage is very, very common. Almost all rootstocks support root tip feeding. And this is important because if you take a shovel once the, once the weather clears and and spring comes along and you go out to your, your vineyard and dig up a few vines, you'll notice there are phylloxera virtually on all the rootstocks. Not many, but they're only on the root tips causing, and really causing almost no damage at that level. They only cause damage to the, to the structural roots uh, in a few species, and that's vinifera, the common European grape, and most of the Chinese species as well uh, support feeding on the main structural roots. None of the American species support that, and we think that's the reason they survive under phylloxera attack. So obviously the phylloxera don't want to kill off their host, just like most pests and parasites. They've got to keep it alive. Uh, they have to keep, keep it active, otherwise there wouldn't be any food source. Uh, so that goes on with phylloxera as well very, very readily. Uh, the root, major structural roots is there, they're damaged. The, the galls that form in them split and crack, and soil-borne fungi and bacteria get into those wounds. And it's the same set of, of fungi you're going to hear about when we talk about young vine decline, or old vine decline, or esca, or measles. They're all... They're all uh, uh, fungi that live in the soil to destroy wood. Uh, if we didn't have those fungi in the soil, we'd have no, nothing to sit on. <laughs> It'd just be wood everywhere. Uh, they're, they're decomposing all that material and, and digesting it. And when they're given an opportunity to get into a root system, uh, they can actually respond fairly aggressively occasionally, and that's what happens in these cases. So we're losing vines to these same rotting organisms. Um, those wounds uh, provide access, and again, they don't occur on, on, um, uh, on most, uh, most American species. Uh, these galls are sort of interesting. At the tips, they form these hook galls. I'll show you some pictures of in a minute uh, that, that are really very distinctive. They're very typical of other insects, too. Ziphonema mm -hmm. index, the dagger nematode vector of fan leaf, we'll talk about today, too, uh, will cause very similar looking galls. Uh, so you have to look closely, but you can see these, these animals. You can get a hand lens and look at them, and they're, they're quite distinct and, and easily read, readily identified. Um, as that feeding occurs on major roots, those roots are splitting and cracking. And again, that's, that's where these, uh, these organisms are getting in and attacking them. The funny thing about the galls they form, uh, 
as the swelling occurs, but then the, the decay gets in and it works radially. It, m most uh, decaying organisms get into a root system or a, or a branch or a trunk and that lesion that forms goes longitudinally up and down that stem or up and down that root system. And in this case, they go sort of circularly. Those, those roots become girdled and pinched. So you end up with a system where you, you suddenly see a, a break point, the, the vines are doing fairly well, and suddenly they just collapse because you've cinctured off a large part of that root system and it's decayed off. It's not like feeding it slowly from the tips and working backwards. It's really more of a case where they drop and, and decline very quickly. Uh, so this, it can be pretty dramatic. So rootstocks, again, were first, first developed to address phylloxera and, and figure out how we can come out dealing with, these, uh, dealing with these things. The French scientists came to the U.S. They spoke with the father of American viticulture, and I always tell my students to take their hat off if, if you say T.V. Munson, because he really is the reason we have rootstocks in many, many regards. He was a Texas, uh, Texas character uh, who was growing grapes in the Denison area and producing hybrid materials as we were across the, across the United States. Well, we always think of... Uh, Plant breeding is, is starting with Mendel uh, about 150 years ago now, uh, when in fact it took uh, 10 or 20 thousands of years to develop new cultivars through careful human selection of almost all crops. We've, we've been plant breeding for a very, very long time and directing those crosses. And we have within grapes too. The American hybrids uh, that were produced along the East Coast and down into Texas and Missouri and various other areas have been produced since about the 1600s in, in the U.S. and, and beyond. So as soon as people got there, they realized these grapes could be useful. They started making those crosses and, and evaluating progeny in those situations, too. So Munson helped them out. Uh, they collected many different American species. They brought them all back to Europe, and they found right off the bat that only two would root from dormant cuttings. This is a very important aspect. You can't be a rootstock if you don't root from dormant cuttings. Uh, you can graft herbaceous cuttings, but it's not very effective. Uh, it's not very competitive in terms of a practice. It's, it's an easy enough thing to do, but you can't really generate large numbers of plant material without, without using dormant cuttings. So riparian and repestris are those two that would root well, and vinifera also roots well. For instance, if you went now and took cuttings of your, of your uh, whatever the variety is, if you've imported something you shouldn't have imported and you want to get more of them, you could propagate that material, stick it in the ground, and the first part of March and, and April, after bud break, those plants would start rooting and push through the soil. And nine out of ten cuttings would root and grow. Uh, in fact, we used to plant vineyards by taking two sticks of a, of a variety, sticking them on the stake and growing, making sure we had one backup one. You'd have at least one that would grow up and develop that way. Uh, so it was a very simple process. Uh, unfortunately, there were, those root systems aren't at all resistant to, to the soil-worn pests, particularly for phylloxera. Uh, so, they put, put these materials back. We started utilizing them as rootstocks. We still use uh, St. George, which is Vitus rupestris. We still use Riparia glowara, which is Vitus riparia. They're pure forms of those species. Uh, they're, they're, they're very, very useful rootstocks today in many, many regards. Uh, we started planting those rootstocks across Europe. They did well for seven to ten years, and suddenly they started collapsing again, particularly on calcareous soils. So on high lime soils, Riparia and Repestris don't take up enough iron to supply the needs of the cyan. And, and those vineyards actually declined. Uh, so what did they do? They went back to Texas. They went to the, the uh, Austin area, east of, and west of Austin, in, in the uh, Fredericksburg area, hill, hill country of Texas. And they started collecting Berlandieri and uh, the species that grows there and bringing it back to, Texas, bringing it back to Europe and, and uh, experimenting with it. First thing they figured out was it wouldn't root well enough from dormant cuttings to be a rootstock. So they said, well, we'll have to hybridize it then with Riparia and Rupestris and with Vinifera. And that's exactly what they did. So they ended up with these classes of rootstocks uh, based on those, those characteristics. The primary concern was, number one, phylloxera resistance, number two, whether it would root or not, and number three uh, and four, uh, whether it was lime tolerant and adapted to varying very, very sites. And that last bit of the adaptation would be to, to drier or wetter soils. So they sort of split the rootstocks into those four major categories. And they're really based upon these species, and that's why we're going to talk about those species a bit more, how they perform, what you can expect from them, because if you go back to the root of these, these uh, rootstocks, uh, back to their origin, you'll find there, that the reasons they were created are the reasons we should be using them in the, in the same sense. I always like this picture. I, when, when I travel, I love to take pictures of graffiti. I don't know where all these pictures have gone. They must be in my books and binders somewhere. Uh, but this one says, Join us, comrades, the killers of phylloxera. And this is a neat little picture that sits up on, the, on a church near Notre Dame in, in, in Paris. And it turns out that it wasn't killers of phylloxera. They really wanted phylloxera to come back and wipe out all the vineyards. It was a neo-prohibitionist movement. Uh, so it wasn't quite as impressive after I learned that, but it's a lovely, lovely uh, bit of graffiti. Uh, 
Uh, on the upper, let's see, on your upper right over there, you'll see the uh, uh, nodosities. These are the, the root tip galls that form from phylloxera. These funny little yellow light swellings that occur in the tip. Uh, if you have good enough eyes and if you have a hand lens, better even yet a dissecting scope with, with magnification, you can actually see the uh, phylloxera feeding on these, on these tips and, and uh, developing and growing and producing eggs. As the colonies get larger, they form down below. Uh, they start creating uh, tuberosities, which are the galls and swellings on structural roots that actually split and crack later on. And they'll form these incredible dense colonies on occasion too. We have to worry about nematodes as well. And the two major categories would be ones that work from inside the root, the endoparasites, sort of represented by root knot nematode. And then the ectoparasites, the one that feed from the outside of the roots, uh, we'll, we'll mention those as well. And not in depth, and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, talk about how, how uh, we can progress towards a to uh, resisting those later on as we go along here. Um, again, from the feeding damage, it, it, it's really the tips that are affected, just like phylloxera again, and, and the ability to take up water is the key thing at first, and then eventually those roots start decaying and rotting, and that's the major aspect when they, they collapse more, more quickly at that point. And the ectoparasites are, parasites are really well typified by Zephyrema index, the dagger nematode that feeds from the outside of the root. They all feed at the root tip and just behind that, uh, that, that structural barrier, the root cap. Uh, they penetrate in those areas, looking for things to feed upon. Some go into the root entirely, some just from the outside. But, but the effect is, is quite similar. Uh, the, the problem with fan leaf uh, or, or Zephyrema index is that it vectors a virus as well, fan leaf virus, and causes uh, tremendous crop loss. And, and root damage at the same time. So you can see that bottom little piece, the, some plants that have been grown in, in the two-ply containers uh, and really a very damaged root system where the nematodes are present and, and no, no damage at all with their resistance. So we'll give you a few examples of how, what, how we can address those through rootstocks as we go along. So phylloxera got into Europe about the 1850s, 1860s. It was first identified in California about the same time. It was first called the Catawba bug. And Catawba is a, a funny pinkish American hybrid that was all the rage uh, in the 1860s and 70s in the US and actually became fairly popular in Europe too, if you go back and look at it. After the phylloxera crisis, it was proclaimed to be the best wine grape in the world, the best way to make sparkling wine in the world. That's because there was no other way to make sparkling wine in the world uh, than without Catawba. Uh, so it's not, not really very pleasant overall, sort of peculiar variety. Uh, so the phylloxera began to be, uh, be identified as, as associated with, with declining vineyards. Uh, by the 1880s, the California Phylloxera Board, the State Phylloxera Board was initiated. And if you, if you want to uh, enjoy a few hours or days or months or weeks, depending on your preference uh, and, and your, your appreciation of libraries, if you'll go back and look at these reports from the California Phylloxera Board, they're remarkable. And they have the first, uh, the first examples of, of um, uh, ampelographic work with grapevines in California. The first examples and discussions of things that uh, various explorers and, and whatnot went out and collected and brought things back into the states. The first warnings of whether or not we should have unlimited uh, plant movement into, into the United States all came from these sort of groupings as, 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 a, as a warning for people. Uh, by, the eight, by, by the 1900s, we started experimenting with rootstocks. And again, we weren't creating rootstocks then. We were experimenting with rootstocks. We were bringing in the immaterials from Europe and testing them in, under California conditions. George Hussman was a USDA scientist that was uh, really instrumental in getting a lot of this done. Again, one of those fathers of American grape culture in many, many regards. Uh, there were at one point over 102 different rootstock varieties. 102. Now there are three. <laughs> if you go to a nursery and say, what do you have? We have Freedom, we have the 1103 Paulson, we have 10114, and we have scatterings and bits of everything else, but not much. Uh, there are other varieties in the state, but 102 is pretty remarkable. Uh, the first report on those trials was, was in 1915, and uh, by the 1930s, there were some, some, some information was coming out to, to sort of approve these materials. As you look at those, those plants from the 1930s, we have AXR1. We'll talk a bit more about the, that aspect here in a second. AXR2, 1202C. All of those plants are vinifera by rupestris hybrids. Uh, so you'd never want to put vinifera in a hybrid crossing because you'd be worried about whether or not it was truly resistant to phylloxera and whether it would reduce that resistance that the rupestris might have. And the answer is that it does. So why would you do it in the first place? Uh, why, did, why was that done in Europe? Well, the first reason is because it rooted uh, extremely well and it would improve the rootability of those rootstocks. The second reason is because it was very lime tolerant, so that was a very positive aspect. Since the Berlandieri component they were grafting or uh, hybridizing in with the other species, really wasn't very rootable, uh, made them difficult to work with. 
And the last was they didn't truly really understand about phylloxera and, and how it was resistant and how it might be prevented. So these were pretty common in California. AXR1, AXR2, uh, 1202C, again, all vinifera biropestris hybrids. There's Lenoir. That's also a vinifera hybrid. It was one of the first accidental hybrids that was used across the south for, for wine production in California. Uh, also not resistant to phylloxera. Uh, St. George, Repair Gloire, 420A, uh, 16149C. That's a rootstock that has some growing interest behind it. Uh, the nursery just trying to, to plant a bit more of it. Uh, 3306, 3309, 1616C, uh, one, uh, 1613C, Dogridge, uh, Ramsey. Again, these are all names that if you've been studying rootstocks and sort of keeping up with the advances there, uh, have, have all been looked at for a very long time, a very long period of time. Across many, many parts of the state, too. Hank Jacob was a UC Davis uh, propagation specialist and nurseryman, nursery specialist uh, from, from the 1950s. Uh, he started looking at these materials as well and, and exploring these tests. He looked not only at these, these plant materials, but at others. And at one point, he had 99 sites in the state across 17 counties. Uh, by the way, there was no I, I-5 at that point. There was no I-80 at that point. There was no way to get around the state in the 1920s and 1930s very conveniently. And you have to start thinking about then what sort of data was acquired from 17 counties off 99 rootstock trials. And the, the answer was quick data. And, and they would look at those plants and grade them visually and say, these look like decent rootstocks, uh, these don't. But they didn't really have time to evaluate those plants very closely and dig up the root systems and look at the production, uh, look at anthocyanin levels and flavanol levels that were induced by the rootstocks. Not, none of that occurred. The plant looked good, and that was what you got to check. It didn't look so good, it got a minus, and they went off to the next plot. Uh, but again, the same sort of plant materials. And, and a lot of the materials, again, focused on vinifera by rupestris crosses. There's the XR1 again, there's 1202C again. There's another one, 93.5C and Ponzo XX, both vinifera by rupestrises. So that was a really positive aspect. And what does it say about the fox in California at that point? A couple of things. Uh, first of all, these trials point to one really, really critical aspect of, uh, that you should evaluate when you look at research plots, and that's the controls. Uh, what's there is a susceptible control to guarantee that flocks was widely spread in these plots? And the answer was nothing. Uh, and the, these plots were generally used in areas that were viticultural, but not necessarily in areas that had a, a history of flocks or damage. Uh, so again, how do you look at those, uh, plates, uh, those sites again and confirm how things were doing? And these plants all performed beautifully. It turns out the most vigorous rootstock and best adapted and one that gives you the best sign growth is the lack of a rootstock, oftentimes. Uh, so in a few places in the world pro will proclaim that our vines are better because we don't use rootstocks. Uh, Ch Chile says that now, although they have gone to rootstocks because of salt and nematodes and also for other reasons as well. Uh, Australia occasionally gets away with that too. Uh, we don't use rootstocks, our plants are better. There's really no documented evidence that, that a plant that has not been grafted uh, performs any better uh, or produces any better wine quality than any other one. Uh, however, they probably last longer uh, and, and they've been less, less uh, physically abused oftentimes in terms of the grafting process. So it's an interesting group of stocks. Again, not, not a lot of variation for what we would find today. Uh, a broader range of things, but not a lot of variation in terms of which ones perform the best. Lloyd Leiter came around and, and he, he was uh, Jacob's replacement initially and sort of intermediary between Jacob's and Olmo. And he started looking at these plots as well, and he, he wrote them up finally. He got all this information set together from these 30, 30 or 40 years of rootstock evaluation. He did a, made a paper on flox resistance amongst those rootstocks and one against nematode resistance across the rootstocks. And one of the conclusions that came out of those studies, again, this is in the 50s uh, and six, early 60s, uh, one of the conclusions was that AXR1 rootstock was very well adapted to the majority of sites in the state under the majority of conditions in the state. But again, thinking those were checks and minuses. They weren't detailed evaluations of those, those materials. Uh, this was during sort of a lull in, in, the, in the, uh, the grape industry. We're coming out of prohibition. Things were going better. Things were suddenly got settled down by the, late, by, the, by the 60s and early 70s. And people said, wow, we're ready for an expansion in the state. And they asked the, the, the UC uh, which rootstock they should use. And they said, well, AXR1 has done really well in most of the sites of California. Why don't you use that one? Um, so it happened. It happened without really full evaluation of these materials. It, it also happened with full awareness that the XR1 had collapsed multiple times around the world under, under uh, vineyard use. Uh, so there was this feeling that California was unique and different. Maybe it wouldn't cause, uh, maybe there wouldn't be flux for damage or decline in those, in those, in those situations. Uh, so we planted XR1 across the state. And the nurseries were, were very happy. It was very easy to propagate, very easy to graft. Uh, 
remarkably tolerant of viruses. So if you take a virus-infected cyan and graft onto AXR1, there is very limited impact to those viruses on, on, uh, on, on the plant itself and on fruit quality. Uh, so that was a positive as well. Uh, and it seemed to do well on most sites. And it did really well for about 15 years, which was the international experience too. You plant this thing in the ground, it grows well for 15 years, then you start seeing decline and collapse of phylloxera. And in fact, if you take own rooted vines and plant them in the ground, it takes about 15 years to kill them from phylloxera. So there really wasn't much resistance involved in this. Uh, we know today, though, that there are forms of phylloxera that still behave uh, like the ones that we must have had at that time period that were not as aggressive on AXR1 or on vinifera sometimes. There's a lot of variation. Uh, those forms were selected for, and my first comment about it's probably a better idea to have a broader range of choices than a more narrow range of choices is also directed back to this idea that if you limit diversity, you're going to increase the chances of, of new, more adapted strains that are, that are going to evolve and develop. In the, that report by Ladder, this, this last sentence was, was uh, noted, and again, this was before we really started using the XR1. He said, it's understood that in very dry, shallow soils, and in areas where flocks are going to be serious, they, the AXR1 vines, may do poorly or even fail. And it was sort of prophetic, and it turned out it occurred everywhere in about that same time period. So we planted in the early 70s. By the mid-80s, we were starting to see decline of vineyards to AXR1 phylloxera. And unfortunately, we planted uh, thousands of acres of them, tens of thousands of acres of them in the North Coast region. Uh, so those vineyards collapsed. They came out, and they were replanted. Uh, the one the few that survived that crisis, the St. George vines, for instance, uh, uh, were fully resistant to this, this form of phylloxera. And we went through a sort of a crisis when we began rethinking uh, how we would use root stocks in, in the state. And it's an important time period. It's important, again, to point out that controls are important, uh, that probably international experiences will be important in terms of applying them to how we've uh, uh, selected things here as well at the same time. So how do you choose a rootstock? Uh, knowing, knowing that background, it's hard to make the perfect choice. In fact, there is no perfect choice. Uh, and, and there are many good choices. Uh, and every site drives that determination of which rootstock is, is most ultimately selected for. But viticultural practices and even winemaking have as much influence on that final bit of, little bit of nuance as, as we go through them. In general, you learn about the species and the rootstocks to avoid making a bad choice. Uh, so when you go to the nursery and they say, well, I have 1103 Paulson ready for that plant material. I can grass that up for you. I have those already ready to go. It's a very good rootstock, just fine. It's probably not the best rootstock for a very vigorous, high-capacity, deep soil. It induced too, too much growth in an area with a lot of rainfall. Uh, it's, it's of, you're going to be fighting that rootstock for the, for the existence of that vineyard in, term, in terms of you know, canopy management and development. So it's, it's a relatively high, vigor stock. 10114, a relatively low, vigor stock with almost no drought adaptation whatsoever. Uh, so which other ones might be better and better adapted? Uh, what's going to happen in the future? How are you going to use this rootstock over time? Those things have to come into play. Uh, and again, those are your, essentially your two choices from, from most, of the, most of the nursery system at this point. Um, so in general, we want this inverse relationship between the, the vigor of the site, the capacity of the site, uh, the, really it's the water holding capacity in many regards to that site, how deep is that soil, how much water can it hold, and the rootstock vigor. We want to try to maintain those. So high vigor sites, high capacity sites, low vigor stocks, trying to manage vegetation in that sense. And the converse would be true, too. On sites that are very low vigor, rocky, gravelly areas, hillside situations, we'd want to use a rootstock with much more horsepower and ability to develop a good, a good sign. Uh, production factors. Well, fruit quality, of course, is critical. Uh, and the, one of the bigger aspects here is whether you're marketing fruit or whether you're marketing wine. And as you go, go across the state and talk with growers, the perspective on what they need is very different in many situations. And, and in Napa, when you're producing uh, 50 to $150 bottle of wines, you can make many mistakes, and most things don't really seem to matter at all in terms of how you can generate these, 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 uh, these scenarios. But in Lodi or, or further south down the valley, uh, the amount of tonnage and yield is going to be very critical. Uh, so as you think about that, that's a, that's a key aspect. So it's, it's more to ask, well, how many tons per acre do you want in the first place uh, before you start making these decisions sometimes? Other key things is whether this is a replant site or a new site. And the state is undergoing a massive replanting, and it's going to continue. Uh, it's going to continue because the vineyards that were replanted after the Phylloxera crisis and in the early 70s are all getting old and tired, and they need to come out and be replaced. And so there's going to be a massive and a continuing replanting of vineyard acreage. There's not a lot of expansion of the vineyard acreage. There's a redevelopment of the vineyard acreage. So those are, those are key aspects as we go along. 
Again, in new sites that are not, have never been in viticulture and are well isolated, you can probably get away with planting old rooted vines for a generation. Whether it's a good idea or not is a very different question. It's probably a very bad idea, but you may be able to get away with it for some period of time. Again, it really limits access to your vineyard and your site. Uh, many years ago, I was down in Australia to give uh, a series of talks with, with, uh, uh, with the Flockshire uh, Board of South, South Australia. And uh, I would start my talks by saying, you people must be out of your minds. They tripled the size of their industry without using rootstocks. They could have solved the whole problem. Instead, they have big signs everywhere, and they're teaching Flockshire to read. It says, Flockshire, stay out. Uh, and again, it's, it's, it's not a very practical solution. They should have gone through and sort of thought, thought things through a bit more carefully. So replant with a new site is a critical aspect. And if it's a replant situation, you need to spend a lot of time thinking and evaluating and considering what might be in that soil. What's built up over that generation of vineyard use? What, are those pro what sort of problems might be induced and what what be coming on next? Uh, Virus-inducing compatibility. This is, this is a big one uh, that we continually are exposed to. Uh, we always preach the value and the importance of our certification program and our system, and it's an evolving program and system. It's getting better and better you go, as we go along in terms of what viruses are there and what we've eliminated. That's a very important aspect. But in reality, the clones that we use in the industry are often not available uh, as a certified format. And then you have to think about whether you want to make that risky choice as well. So you, you decided that this somewhat obscure clone might be very important, and you go to the nursery and say, uh, can I get this clone you know, certified and grafted on the certified rootstock? And the answer was, maybe, uh, maybe not. And it depends on their availability and what they had in, the, in those situations. But you're going to be taking a risk by using that virus-infected material. In the worst case scenario, uh, we have death of, of the graft union, usually about three or four years into the vine life, which is, which is unfortunate because it's hard to assess blame in those situations as it goes along. Uh, in the less worst case scenario, you're going to have reduced fruit quality and, and more intensely reduce food quality, too. So the desired clones may to be certified. That's a big problem. And the availability of those materials is also a big problem as we go along. And it leads to the scenario now where we have three rootstocks available uh, plentifully. And, and uh, we have, in reality, about 30 that, that might be available if, you could really, if the nurseries really supplied them evenly. So why don't they supply them evenly? Because it wastes a huge amount of money. If they can't sell all the cuttings from those various rootstocks, they've got to plow them under each year. Uh, so it's really not very valuable. And it goes back again to the industry, making sure we have a broader demand for plant material, not a more narrow demand for plant material, to try to encourage the development of better things. OK, so we think about our site. We think about what might be there. Um, we think about rotation and how we're going to rotate to the next generation in terms of what we're growing. And we're, we're not going to, to uh, pull out grapevines on the North Coast and plant almonds. We might pull out uh, grapevines in, in, in Lodi and a little bit further south uh, and plant almonds, but we won't do that here. We're going to have to have a high value crop. There's, very, there's, there's limited choices. So the, the idea of rotation is difficult. What do we rotate through to? Uh, well, we rotate the rootstock. That's the most important part. So we can solve the soil-based problems by, by using a different choice. And we can actually broaden that choice uh, very carefully by choosing materials that are distantly, distantly related genetically. So they're not similar. They have the same characteristics, but not the same genetic control, perhaps, of their resistances and characteristics. This is, uh, so we have two major tenets of agriculture. If you teach a basic plant science course, at some point you're going to talk about fallow, and you're going to talk about crop rotation. Those are key. So leaving that, so that soil out of production for some period of time and rotating to a different crop. And we don't do that at all with viticulture. Uh, we, we can't afford to. So if we paid uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars per acre for a property, you can't really say, well, it's a good idea just not to plant anything there for a year or two and let those soils sort of rejuvenate. And we should, but we don't. Okay? That, that's, a, that's a key issue. And why might it be more important than we think? Well, here's a classic case here. This is a vineyard uh, above um, 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 Lake Hennessy, where I was up, up at Chaplet's property on these slaty terrace hillsides that had had a vineyard removed seven years earlier. And nothing had grown there. And it was in the height of the drought. Uh, there was no plant material there. In fact, when we took the backhoe across to these terraces, there were sparks flying all over the place from ch cutting through the slate, completely bone dry. And we got down about four feet. And I said, I'd love to look at these roots and, and see what we have down there. And are there any roots down there? And there were some grape roots were identifiable. So we, I took those grape roots home. And I put them in a, in a plastic bag with a little bit of native soil. And I left them on, the, on my desk. And I went back to work. 
uh, in, in about three or four weeks, those bags started becoming moist. There was something alive, respiring inside those, those bags. And it could have been bacteria from the soil, so it didn't excite me very much at first. Uh, and then in a few more weeks, I noticed roots growing. And if you look closely in that picture, you'll see a small little rootlet. And more importantly, on the cut edges of all those root pieces, there was callus developing, callus tissue developing there too. The roots were alive. They hadn't had any top associated with them for seven years. It had been very dry, they were deep in the soil, and they were perfectly alive. And they were producing new tissue that a nematode or phloxer would feed upon. Huh. So the question then becomes, is crop rotation, or is crop fallow, is fallowing from crop production effective at all in viticulture? And the answer is uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but again, the most important lesson to be learned is, how do we address that? If there's stuff there still, what rootstock should we be using that might help to address that? Okay, that's the key component. So this idea of rotation can be achieved through, through changing root stocks. And fallow, well, whether or not we can use fallow, uh, is tricky. But we certainly wouldn't want to do the worst thing possible, which would be to pull the vineyard, uh, plant it again right the next spring with the same root stock again on the same soil. It's saying, that root stock did beautifully for me before. I'm going to use it again. So a very young root stock is a very different plant than an old root stock. Uh, the, the new, that new plant system can be attacked very aggressively and the fruit tips fed upon very aggressively and it can be damaged pretty readily. Uh, that it wouldn't, you wouldn't see any damage at all on a mature plant. We talk about 1103 pollen being quite nematode resistant and salt tolerant and drought tolerant. It turns out that it really just produces a lot of roots. It's able to just keep generating roots all the time. It's a different sort of strategy in terms of adaptation than, than other types. So it's a different sort of choice and I think you have to really think about those, those aspects. Okay, so what are the species? Well, Riparia, Rupestris, and Berlandieri. It's actually a pretty easy lesson. There's only three really important ones, and they make up 90% of, of all the rootstocks that we have, ha have available to us at this point. Whether that's a good idea or not is a different question, and we'll, we'll get to that at, uh, towards the end and talking about what other choices might be there. So this is a funny species. It grows from Manitoba to Texas, and from the Rocky Mountains all the way east to the Atlantic Ocean, the broadest range of any of the grape species. Tremendous variation. Uh, that you could, you could expect. Um, and it turns out, as we've done some recent testing, that if we looked at 60 different rootstocks across the, across the world, and we looked at their genetic diversity and traced back their parentage, it turns out that 40% of them have exactly the same parents. The same selection of riparia, the same selection of rupestris, and the same selection of berlandieri. And we've been using them now for 100 years, over 100 years. So this is sort of a ticking time bomb in terms of adaptation and, and, and ability of these things to really do well over time. Um, so again, riparia. Why would we use riparia? Number one reason, it roots. Okay, that's the, the most important reason. It, it resists phloxera and it roots well from dormant cuttings. Uh, it's very readily grafted or, and propagated. That picture up there is the Missouri River uh, near, near where Lewis and Clark set off to, to conquer the Western world or at least the western United States, and all the stuff growing on the, in the foreground and on all every tree is a riparia vine. There's a vitus riparia vine every spot along that, that, that corridor there. The soils are very finely silty alluvial soils. Uh, they're, not, they're, not, they're not in rapidly, uh, uh, rapidly um, uh, flowing creeks. They're in big, broad expanses of water where slow, fine alluvium settles down. Uh, it's very commonly in that regard. It gets, it's a huge amount of water that's achieved there. They're growing in that, that water profile. And if they're not there, they're back 100 yards and they're getting rained upon all the time. So they're, they're, well, they're well into that rainy part of the US in terms of a habitat. So very alluvial soils. They clamber up into trees very readily. Uh, they have shallow roots, very shallow roots, there, which, which induce low vigor. Uh, and they tend to hasten maturity. In fact, some of the forms of riparia have a very short growing season. They're from Manitoba. <laughs> You know, they don't have a very long growing season there. Uh, the season starts at the 1st of June and it ends on September, September 30th. So it's a very tight window of, of growth opportunity. And that trait comes forward. Those, those plants actually hasten maturity in, in, gra in grafted combinations. Okay. Uh, let's go back to the grape, to grape vine for a second here too. It, it Con talked a bit about the physiological behavior. Grape vines are very strange plants. Uh, first of all, they're vines. And they're peculiar things that they don't really need a, a trunk to hold themselves up in the sky. They use trees to hold themselves up. So they don't really have a structural process there. They don't really need many roots because they live in water most of the time. There's only one species that lives away from water. We don't really have drought resistance uh, 
uh, in grapefruit socks. We have drought adaptation, but not resistance. Uh, they, they, they grow in these spots. Their main directive is to grow as fast as they can up on top of a tree so they can get broad exposure of, of the canopy. Uh, that's why we talk about vegetative to reproductive to crop load indices. The Ravas index is all about how quickly that plant grows up trying to achieve light and, and, and capture light versus how it produces crop. And remember, in the wild, as a wild plant, they're, they're not perfect flowered. They're either male vines or female vines, uh, completely separate from each other. Uh, and the male vines tend to be very rapidly growing. The female vines tend to grow less rapidly uh, and, and less aggressively. Uh, they also have a responsibility of maturing seed, which slows them down and changes the way they allocate carbon, too. So in terms of where carbon goes in the plant, it goes first to the shoot tips. Then it goes to the trunk system to some extent. And then if it's a male or if it's a female vine, it goes into the fruit system. And then if you're lucky, it goes into the root system. So the root system, when we talk about training vines and the developing vines, the root system is not a strong sink, not a strong sink for carbohydrates. It's the, sort of the last part, the last place that stuff goes in a vine. So that's why we talk about developing good roots first, uh, developing lots of foliage to develop roots and then retrain the vine, not train it up right away, not fruit it right away, because we'd overtax that vine and not, not allow it to develop. Okay, so there's riparia. Uh, shallow, shallow roots are the, is the important thing. Uh, some of these forms from our northerly climates uh, uh, do hasten maturity. Uh, of the ones we have in rootstocks, it's all riparia gloir. Uh, there's hardly anything else in the background of these materials. Uh, and we don't know where riparia gloir came from, uh, in what, what part of that zone, that range it, it came from. But it behaves like some of the more sort of Midwestern forms of riparia. Okay, so easy to propagate, and riparia gloir is our example of, of, a, of a rootstock. Here's Vitus rupestris in its native habitat. Uh, and I should have a picture of that gravel, but it's all a gravelly creek bed here, not a fine alluvium. This is a coarse, gravelly, sort of churdy sort of a substrate. And this is a vine that is not a vine. It's a shrub. Uh, it grows on the edges of these creeks on the side. And there's, there's Eric Wada, one of my past students, uh, happily holding Vitus rupestris after a long day of driving through the hillsides of Missouri, looking, looking all the way through. And there we find it in this creek bed uh, down with the chiggers, which was exciting too. Um, and it has a very deep root system. This is not a shallow root system. It's a deep root system with these large chunks of gravel. And it, that's deep so it can hold itself in place. So this is a the place that doesn't necessarily get full of water very often. But when it does, has a huge, huge flow that comes through and pulls all the vegetation, all the fines and all the soil, if you like, out of that creek bed and leaves just that gravel. It also has a system of growth then that, in, that encourages layering. So when you go and find these vines and think you're, thinking you're going to get a lot of diversity in your collections, you better, you better do a find here and then a mile later find another one because otherwise that plant, might, that plant might be the same along that whole creek bed as it layers and is covered with gravel over time. Okay? So this plant used to grow from, from, uh, from Tennessee all the way to Texas. Uh, it was abundant in those areas. And in the 1840s and 1850s, uh, the government told the Easterners who were becoming overpopulated to move west and just steal the land, and off they went. And with them went their cattle, and the cattle ate rupestris out of existence. So, so it's almost extinct now. It was very common up until about the 1900s, and now it's extremely rare to find. Uh, it's in southern Missouri, but very few other spots now. So this is a plant with a very, very deep root system to hold itself in place, and it's not drought resistant at all. It's drought adapted because that large system is able to mine more water. But if you put it on a dry hillside and expect it to perform well or perform aggressively without water, uh, you're, you're going to be probably unhappy with its overall performance. It'll do better than riparia for sure, but there will be better, better examples if we had drought resistance. Okay. Its resistance to phloxera is, is good, uh, although variable, and it supports a lot of phloxera in some situations. And St. George, uh, one of our few accessions that's generally used through, through all the rootstock parentages as well, uh, is, I would say, moderately resistant to phloxera at best. So it actually supports a fair amount of phloxera on the root tips oftentimes. Not damaging phloxera, but the root tip feeding phloxera. Uh, St. George is a neat rootstock. It, it, it's one of the few that doesn't have vernifera in it that is virus tolerant also. So you can graft a virus infected material. It's going to perform better on St. George than it would on 5C or 3309C or 110R or a lot of other choices too. So it's, it's, it's relatively adaptable from that perspective. Uh, it is not resistant to nematodes at all. So if you have a high nematode population or counts in your vineyard, this would be a bad choice to, to go right into that situation. Okay, so they planted riparia, planted rupestris. Uh, 
Um, the reason that the Europeans really don't like Americans may not be entirely because of, because of phylloxera, the first phylloxera crisis. It might be secondarily because the second phylloxera crisis is what really disturbed them after they started replanting all the vineyards on Riparia and Rupestris, purely Riparia and Rupestris. Those vineyards collapsed about seven to ten years into their growth. They had to pull them out and start all over again, and they didn't have a solution again because they hadn't started using Verlandieri in their crosses. So they went back, found Verlandieri, brought Verlandieri back to Europe, crossed it with Riparia, crossed it with Rupestris, and made to what we use primarily around the world as rootstocks at this, at this point. So they went back to the limestone hills of Texas where you can find Berlandieri in abundance and they collected it, brought it back, hybridized it, and solved the lime and phloxera crisis again at the same time. So things were, things were better one, once again. Um, this is an interesting species. There are some forms that grow in incredibly dry areas and some forms that are very effective at hydraulic lift. And this might be a really true <coughs> drought resistance uh, behavior. So hydraulic lift means that the plant can pull water from depth and redistribute it not into the foliage, but into the surface roots and to keep them active. So it's a, a means of, of growing longer and more effectively with less water, uh, less water in the upper part of the soil profile anyway. Again, it depends upon a deep root system to, to mine that water effectively, and, and it generally has that, that deeper root system. What are the rootstocks in the background? Well, there's a few other stocks that are important, we'll mention today, and one of them has Champinii in the background. Champinii is a form of a, is a hybrid form of, of Vitus candycans, the, the very common Mustang grape of Texas. And here you have one growing in a cottonwood tree. There's a little red circle there with one of my graduate students, past students, uh, Claire Heinitz, sitting at the bottom of this tree. And 90 feet in the air is this amazing Vitus candycans pulling down this cottonwood. So this is one of the, the peculiar grapevines. Uh, the other bit about grapevines, so that not only are, are um, peculiar plants being vines, but they're also weeds in the wild. They're not permanent residents of a forest structure. Uh, they're weeds, they come onto the peripheral areas, and they, they have to climb and, and devour their support system to survive. Otherwise, the support system crowds them out, and that's what happens in most cases. They live 25, 30 years and decline. Grapevines really aren't long-lived. Uh, they really are 25 to 30 year phenomena, botanically or, or uh, naturalistically. Um, so th they're not designed to be a long-lived plant. And the primary reason is because the tree they're growing on overwhelms them at some point. They, they're unable to, to outgrow it. <coughs> Candy cans is an entirely different beast. It, over, it pulls the tree down. It's a very vicious, very aggressive grapevine. More like kudzu than, than grapevine in many regards. Uh, and we have lots of hybrid forms of it between different plants from the Texas area. And there's lots of stuff that might be useful in terms of breeding, both in terms of high vigor and, and, and resistance to a few pests. So it's, a, it's something you'll hear more about over time uh, as we go along. Very, very deep roots, uh, very high vigor, too high a vigor in most scenarios. So it's, it's going to be maybe too aggressive for many spots to, where we want more moderate growth in, in more moderate parts of the state. Will it be more effectively drought resistant over time if things get hotter and, and uh, less, less uh, convenient for, for viticulture? Uh, maybe. Uh, maybe it just needs more water though and that'll, that won't, that'll be a self-defeating aspect as well in some regards. So the two rootstocks we have that are pure Champinii are Ramsey and, and, or Salt Creek, that's the same material, and Dog Ridge. And uh, again, they're at the very high end of vigor. There's a bit of Acerifolia. This is a species that, that exists on the border of Texas and Oklahoma that goes up to Kansas a bit and across to New Mexico a bit. And it's a funny plant that, that's really hybridizing with a few other species at the same time, primarily with Riparia. And the more Riparia you have in those backgrounds, the better it roots. And the less you have, the more poorly it roots and develops too. So it can be a funny plant, but we call it the gully grape or the gulch grape, and it lives in these areas of, of uh, very dry, of low precipitation. Uh, when it does rain, it's five inches a day, and then it stops raining for a few years. Uh, so it has, again, a very deep root system that mines water uh, fairly aggressively and effectively. So far, good flux resistance in trials, uh, uh, variable nematode resistance, some, some it's excellent, some it's not so good. Pretty good salt resistance, too, in some backgrounds. We have a couple of rootstocks with a rotundifolia in the background. You'll notice it's not a vitus, it's a muscadinia. It's a very distantly related uh, plant uh, compared to the rest of the vitus species. It won't make fertile hybrids, so as a breeder, it's a very difficult thing to use. It resists everything we're looking for in terms of pests and diseases, but we can't produce a progeny that we can improve in any way because it's sterile. Right? So we can't take a hybrid offspring and cross it to another parent and improve uh, traits that are maybe short in. 
Uh, Rotunda folios from the southeastern United States, very different sort of area, acidic soils, lots more rainfall, um, uh, tr tremendously more rainfall in some situations. It's not a very large plant. Uh, it has some advantages. Again, tremendous nematode resistance and pest resistance in this background. What's its limitation? That besides a fertility barrier, it won't root from dormant cuttings. It not roots poorly, it won't root from dormant cuttings. So it's a very difficult plant to utilize in that regard. So you've got to cross it to something that improves its rooting, but you only have one chance because you can't take that hybrid and cross it again with something that improves rooting because it's not, not fertile. And so we end up with a, a, a sterile dead end. Okay, so that said, we have only a few pure forms of the species as rootstocks. All the rest are hybrid combinations. And those hybrid combinations came from the idea of taking two different sorts of parents, achieving the best traits from one parent, the best traits from the other parent, and selecting out the forms that had both good rooting, better phlox resistance, better nematode resistance, a high vigor, low vigor, uh, shallow roots, deep roots, all those sort of considerations. So the repair by Repestris group, uh, why would we make that, that cross? Well, it came before people realized that they were going to collapse to, uh, due to Lyme. So we didn't have a Lyme in these backgrounds, or very, they were very fertile, non-calcareous sites to begin with. And they realized in most cases that pure riparia was too weak. It did not generate enough growth, did not have an expansive enough root system to really work very well. So they were saying, well, let's improve it with rupestris. We know it has deeper roots. It's from these more gravelly soils and we can generate both a better, deeper plant with, with good propagation and uh, good flox resistance. So that, that's what this, what this aim was to get, a more moderate, bigger rootstock. But when you make a cross between anything, you get the extreme seedlings or progeny that are much like one, either one of the parents, and then you get progeny that are right in the middle that are a little bit of both parents, and you get everything in that integration to either, either extreme. So in this background, we have 10114, which is probably the most shallow-rooted least vigorous rootstock that's possibly available at this point, um, uh, which is not necessarily a good thing. And we'll talk more about pluses and minuses as we go. Uh, Schwarzman is another good example, with, which is more rupestris-like, so a little bit more deep root, a little more vigorous. Uh, 3309C, uh, not widely grown in California anymore because of its uh, extreme virus sensitivity uh, and, and very, very high nematode susceptibility as well. Uh, but there is a range of the materials within here in terms of low to mo more moderate vigor. Again, why would we want a moderate vigor rootstock on a high vigor site? We would rather put a lower vigor, more moderate vigor rootstock, trying to moderate and, and control vegetative growth a bit more effectively. You wouldn't call any of these stocks drought resistant. Uh, and, and they don't have deep enough roots or more deeply penetrated roots to be considered as drought resistant. And again, on a day like today, it's pretty easy to make jokes about whether drought is an important component to our future viticultural decision making process, but it is. Uh, and, and you can already, I think, as you look at uh, water availability politically or environmentally or viticulturally how, or on all, all fronts, it doesn't really matter, you're clearly not going to have more water in a vineyard now uh, than you, or in the future than you are going to have now. Water is, a, is definitely going to be considered as a very different resource over time. And today we still have, have legislation that says that if you, if you live on top of it, that's your water, but that's not likely to continue much longer. Next drought crisis is going to cinch that off very effectively too. So you have to, I think really if you're thinking about a 30-year-old planting, which is a fairly safe 20 to 30-year-old vineyard planting lifespan, uh, during the span of that, uh, the lifespan of that vineyard, there's going to be water uh, availability issues. So again, planting a very low vigor, water demanding rootstock in, in California is probably not the best solution in my opinion. And we can argue that, and a lot of people do, um, but uh, in, the, in the long run, it's probably not the best, uh, best approach to these things. 1616C is a, it's a funny rootstock uh, that's a cross between Salonis, and Salonis is a form of Acerifolia, our friend in Oklahoma and northern Texas. Uh, a deeper root system, again, by a very shallow root system, less rootable by a more rootable uh, cross. Uh, it has fairly good nematode resistance, good phylloxera resistance. Um, it's not drought resistant, it's fairly low vigor. It, it's a little bit peculiar in terms of a rootstock. In, in most of the trials we've had for, uh, through the campus-based uh, system over the years, this is one that has less vegetation and equivalent crop. So it tends to be fairly fertile, it produces a lot of clusters, and, and limits growth at the same time. Generally, when you limit growth, you limit crop, and you may not want that. In fact, uh, a lot of people will be discouraged by that in terms of the very low vigor material. Uh, if, if money is not critical in terms of crop value, uh, then that could, that's a different sort of decision too. But this is generally a fairly low vigor stock, uh, not drought adapted particularly, uh, 
but pretty good nematode resistance. Not, not superb, but pretty good nematode resistance. One of the things that also is fairly good at it is it's fairly tolerant of wet waterlogged soils. It's done well in thick, mucky clays um, for whatever reason. Um, and it's not, not well known yet, and, and uh, but it, 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 it does pretty well. Okay, so we have that group, the Riparia by Rupestris. Now we think about how we might change these things if you needed lime tolerance. And the Berlandi area has to be in the background then, so we have a series of stocks that are with Riparia that tend to be lower vigor, uh, more moderate to low vigor, and a series of stocks with Rupestris which tend to be higher vigor and more aggressive. So this is the Riparia based grouping here. And, and the most common ones we use today still are 5BB, 5C, which for many years was, was uh, mislabeled mis, uh, as SO4. Uh, and we have SO4-2 as well as a separate plant. 420A, which is get the lower end of bigger, and, and a, some interest in 16149C, but not a lot of availability yet uh, for an even lower bigger member of this grouping too. Uh, these tend to be, the ones that tend to be lower bigger tend to be more riparian-like and less drought adapted. And they also have root systems that slow down under deficit irrigation, slow down and stop, and in general don't start again for a very long time. Uh, so a lot of the rootstocks, again, the advantage of 1103 Paulson is you turn the water on, the roots come out. You turn the water off, roots go away. Turn the water on, they come back again. Uh, they actually sprout out and start developing very readily. Uh, so it's a different sort of beast. And a lot of these will slow down and stop. And so when you're looking at a deficit irrigation scheme and trying to control vegetation that way, you can slow these stocks back too much, and they don't regenerate quickly enough to address uh, heat spikes that you know are coming in the future. So that, that can be a major deficit with it, too. Uh, they also, like 10142, uh, do fairly poorly in cracking clay soils. The ones that split and fissure in the summertime actually physically damage these rootstocks because they have a lot of surface rooting uh, tendency and it'll crack and damage those roots too. Among this group, one of the more interesting ones, at least at the high end of, of the, the Cabernet market and, and the Pinot Noir market for that as well, is 420A, <laughs> looking for a stock with lower vigor, less, and more, more suppression of growth. Uh, it's a peculiar rootstock. It, it's uh, more Berlandieri-like. It does seem to have some drought tolerance, some root, root adaptation that gets a little deeper and more aggressive. Uh, it is uh, devigorating. Uh, one of its problems is it doesn't propagate very well. And it's one of those stocks that the, you should think about that as a consumer. Uh, you're part of the problem with stocks like this because if, if you go to a nursery and say, I want 10,428 grafted plants, they're going to have to start with 30,000 cuttings to give you those 10,000 plants. And of the 10,000 plants you receive, not 10,000 that are going to be very high quality necessarily. It's a very hard stock to propagate. So it's really, uh, it's not just the nursery's fault that those plant materials don't come out very well in the end. It's partly that, the, the fault of those people requesting it. It's a hard, hard stock to use. Um, it's funny, when you start looking at these stocks, if you look at them, and, and if you want to take a rootstock ampelography class with me in the, in the summertime, it's usually the hottest day of August that I have the class, just, just for you guys. Um, no, it's not intentional. Uh, but, but, but if you go out there and look at these plants, you'll see that once you learn what Berlandieri looks like, and you learn what Riparia looks like, and you learn what Rupestris looks like, you can see the hybrid combination when you look at those, those uh, rootstock choices. You can see that this one's definitely Berlandieri by Rupestris or Berlandieri by Riparia. And more importantly, you can tell when they're more Berlandieri-like or more Riparia-like. And just by appearance, uh, you, you can sort of predict how they're going to behave, and it actually is pretty close. Uh, when they get, as you look at these things, do you want them more Berlandieri-like, which means they're going to root more poorly, but the roots will be deeper. They may actually be, be truly more drought adapted too. So you can sort of look at and see how these things will fit together in, in, in some ways. Uh, but it, 420A is, a, is an interesting example of a sock that, that normally I wouldn't recommend very often because it's very difficult to propagate and the success rate is low and your quality might be, might be very high. But at the same time, it's a, it has a combination of characters that people are looking for, with lower vigor and, and better drought adaptation, perhaps, in some ways, too. So Berlandi by Rupestris, so the two good examples, 1103 and 110R, uh, very different rootstocks. Uh, one that produces roots all the time, one that sort of stops back and sits and then, and then uh, regenerates roots as well. Uh, but it's a different, different sort of stock, a little, little less vigorous, too. They're both, they're both higher vigor than the last groupings. They produce a lot more vegetation than the last grouping. Uh, they can induce high, high vigor and excessive vigor, uh, particularly in the spring when the canopy sort of is all going vegetative and it's hard to get good set and emphasis of the photosynthase into the cluster zone at that time period as the vine gets sort of out of balance. Uh, some of these can be, they're, they're available, like, might be even higher vigor, like 140 Ruggeri. And 140 Ruggeri is one that has been sort of in the back roads for a long time, hard to get a hold of. 
but has excellent salt resistance, the, the best of any commercial rootstock. So if you're here from the San Joaquin Valley and you're thinking, what, kind, what stock should I be using on the west side and areas where the water quality is poor, here's one that's a good choice. Whether it's useful at all, the north coast is not known. It, it didn't really come through those 60 years of rootstock trials with high colors, and it was harder to propagate, again, more Berlandieri-like in many, many regards, too. Of this batch, 1103 has come to the top and sort of assumed dominance. Um, it does, again, have amazing roots that, that, that generate a lot of new root tips all the time and, and, and uh, moderate to high vigor in those, in those scenarios as well. The Champigny stocks, Ramsey and Dog Ridge, uh, not all that widely used in wine grapes anymore. And in fact, even with table grapes, really on the downslide because people are looking to try to moderate vegetation, try to sort of emphasize the fruit and, and fruit quality, better light penetration, much larger canopies of them with wine grape. But again, thinking about how do I even moderate that larger canopy in a better regard. Uh, and these, these uh, rootstocks have, have been on sort of the decline over the last few years, but they have good nematode resistance, mm, moderate to, to, to poor uh, salt resistance, some benefits maybe, but again, we're seeing them declining rather than, than increasing. At the bottom there is freedom and harmony. The, the Champigny base of freedom and harmony is important. That's where the nematode resistance comes from. That's where some of the other characteristics that are critical are coming from as well. Um, and these are higher vigor nematode resistant stocks that can be useful. The O3916 is the only rotundifolia stock that's widely available so far. There's a couple, one more I'll talk about a little bit, little bit here in a second. Uh, th these were bred by OMO. Uh, there were a number of these vinifera by retentifolia hybrids and optimized by Leiter and, and Goheen uh, and, and released by them as well. Uh, they have very good uh, dagger nematode resistance. They have poor root knot nematode resistance. So that can be a problem. Uh, if they're in very sandy soils where high root knot counts exist, uh, th there can be big, big issues there. They're half retentifolia, which doesn't root and half renifera, which roots beautifully, and they don't root very well compared to other rootstocks. So they're hard to get good quality plants with. And again, it's one of those plant materials that, that a lot of the nurseries don't like to deal with at all uh, because of their, their uh, weak, weak propagation characteristics. They have very deep roots. They sort of plunge down like carrots. Uh, they tend to be relatively high vigor and fairly aggressive. Those, those can be problematic uh, situations for them, but, but in general, we can use them. And they, they do pretty well with deficit irrigation in terms of cutting back growth, slowing them down, and moderating in that sense. So if, if you have O3916, if you need to use it in a fan leaf site, uh, you can easily uh, moderate its growth in two ways. One with a little larger canopy, so you have more, more bud positions to, to grow from, and two from, from careful irrigation. And I think you're going to talk about diseases later on again, but fan leaf will come up as, as we go. The main problem here is poor fruit set, and again, gener uh, moved move by, uh, by this nematode in the soil. What root stock choices do we have for O3916? One. Uh, so you're sort of stuck. I mean, for, uh, for fan leaf sites, is, is O3916. So you're sort of stuck. There really aren't a lot of good uh, alternatives for this at this point. So which root stock to use? You can look at them as those species, as riparia based, rupestris based, and berlandieri based. Um, I don't think you got a copy of my talk beforehand, but I, but I can make sure you get this if you need them for notes as well. Uh, I can send this along to the con for, for, for you all. And you can look at that group that's riparia-based, uh, rupestris-based, uh, and get some sort of feeling for how they all exist. Most importantly, you can get some sort of idea that if I pulled out a vineyard and it was on 110R, then what other choices do I have that aren't 110R? And even better would be if it wasn't within that Berlandier by rupestris background, what if it was in a different background? Then you'd have even less chance of adapting nematodes and fungi and things to that root system, and you could break up that cycle uh, more effectively and control pests more effectively. A and in many regards, this is a social issue too, <laughs> not just an individual issue. It's a social issue where we might want to say, yes, as a region, we should be using more stocks, not fewer stocks. We should be trying to discourage the development of more aggressive strains and, and, and uh, types of these, these insects and nematodes. Okay, so there's the Berland area base. Again, we've gone through those stuff. It just sort of puts them in a big grouping for you too. That last line is the most important statement there, unfortunately. Sight trumps all. What does that mean? Well, if you take all these root stocks we've talked about, all 30 of them, and you line them up, and you put them in a very deep alluvial soil at Davis, and you give them as much water as they can need and use, they grow exactly the same. There's no difference amongst them. They have, it's, it's remarkable. If you put some stress on them, things change rapidly. So decrease soil depth, uh, decrease irrigation availability, uh, put some other chemicals to rest upon them, you'll start seeing differences. But without them, uh, they behave about the same.
Um, it was sort of the take-home message after many years of rootstock evaluations. So the site was the most important thing. And the same thing is true with clonal evaluation. The site is the most important thing. So it really means that if you're growing, if you're developing grapes, growing grapes for, for, for a living more than a hobby, you should be looking at various combinations. You should be looking at which ones are best adapted, which clones are best adapted, which rootstocks are best adapted. And it'll be different in your vineyard than it'll be in your neighbor's vineyard. It's, it's a, a remarkable phenomenon. And there's a chart we can give, give you two in these notes that, that take all the rootstocks. The most vigorous stock is in the upper left-hand corner, and it works itself all the way down to the least vigorous as, as repair goar. So they can get some idea of maintaining this idea, this concept of high vigor stocks for low vigor sites, low vigor stocks for high vigor sites. And then think about, again, what are the rootstocks are more or less in that vigor zone that don't have the same parentage or background. The asterisk means sometimes. <laughs> the asterisk means there's a lot of good examples where that didn't work out. Um, the asterisk means that sometimes these things are not labeled properly, uh, but we don't know that necessarily in the field. So we see a lot of funny and all sort of situations in, in, in many spots. Okay, I think I've talked about that enough already too. So I started breeding with stocks to develop more broadly resistant uh, stocks to, to more nematodes, different sorts of nematodes that was the main emphasis here. And we've released a GRN series, Grape Root Stocks for Nematode series of stocks, one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, they resist three stains of root knot nematode, including two that aggressively feed on harmony and freedom root stocks. So we wanted to get uh, these, these adapted uh, types that, that were beyond, beyond others. They also resist Siphonema index, the dagger nematode. They also resist all these nematodes at once, and they resist all these nematodes at once in a soil inoculum at high soil temperatures, which was key because it turns out that that Champignon resistance falters and breaks down at about 28 degrees C, about 80, 82 or 3 degrees Fahrenheit in the soil. Uh, it's, it doesn't work any longer, and it's the same resistance gene that occurs in tomatoes and peppers and a lot of other plants that also break down about that same temperature. And that soil temperature, gosh, that's too hot. Uh, no, that's pretty common in, in warmer climates, uh, not even in hot climates, to have near the surface those sort of soil temperatures. Down a foot or two, that's different. But all the roots and all the nematodes are in that, in that upper uh, foot and a half of soil, so it's a different sort of environment there too. So they resist all those, and they resist differentially citrus nematode and ring nematode uh, and uh, lesion nematode. And they all have fairly good flocks resistance, except for the GRN5, which supports a fairly fair amount of uh, nidosities. So those are available stock choices as well. We can't give you a whole lot of data because we don't have a lot of data yet uh, on their performance over many different sites. But they're, they're coming along and becoming more, more utilized. And they have very different backgrounds. That was one of the key things. So I'm not going to go through and talk about the other species too. But there was an effort made to make sure we're, we were breaking up that genetic similarity and having more genetic diversity to, to address these pests. OK. I think Larry will probably talk about this later. Plant high quality plants properly. It's unbelievable. That sounds so simple. <laughs> it's, it's amazing how many vineyards are poorly planted. You've gone through all this effort to develop it and establish it and get it ready to go, and then you don't take the time and effort to arrange the roots properly, to layer them properly, to either trim them back if they need them, to make sure they're not kinking and j-rooting. Those are really critical things, and it's amazing how many vineyards are declining around the state because of poor planting practices. Use certified virus-free plant materials. Also, that seems like a no-brainer. <laughs> Well, they're not available all the time. Uh, it makes it tricky. And sometimes you have to compromise on your, your, your wished for clone and what's available. And what's available are the standard clones. And why are they standard? Because they do pretty well in many different locations. They're not necessarily better and or worse than any other selection. So I think the, uh, the concept of a virus-free or virus-certified, virus-tested material is still very, very important. Okay? If, the, if your choice is not available, use rootstock sign combinations that have performed well. So if you can't get the stock combination you want, and you know your neighbor's planted on something that, that's exactly the same, go look and see how that's performed and see how well it's done. Uh, it takes about four years, three to four years, to start seeing the impact of viruses in the background. And if that, that combination looks good, it's probably going to work out fine. And that was the whole foundation of, of the certification programs initially. They looked like they grew well. Uh, they performed well. That was, that was key. It wasn't the exact virus status, that material, to start with. So, so make sure you have some feeling of of how it's going to do. If you're not going to pay attention to the virus certified rule, then you should be looking at, at uh, making sure they perform well over time. Establish the root system first. Don't stress the vines. Uh, they need roots. They don't emphasize roots as a plant. 
right? So we need to try to encourage that to develop them to, to get a decent plant. Reciprocally, you could say, well, I really want small plants, and I want to challenge them, and I don't want a lot of vegetative growth, then you should stress them. Go ahead and stress them as, as much as you'd like to try to control plants in that sense. You, you'd uh, not oftentimes, uh, you, you may be in a situation where you can't really accommodate for stress in those situations. And avoid overcropping stress in the first fruiting year. And uh, that's also important because, again, the, that root system is not competing for the uh, photosynthesis very, very effectively. Okay, here's a really bizarre vineyard. This is a sad one. It's a good example, though, of good planting practices. So this was a case where they had dormant, uh, dormant <coughs> rootstock material. They had a water cannon to, to plant the plants with, so they blasted a hole through clay-like soil because it took too much time and money and effort to, to plant them uh, by, with shovels. Uh, they shoved the plants into the hole, and they didn't trim the roots back. So they left on a, about a four to five inch piece of root system, and it bent back up when they shoved them in the ground in this, this little hole that was planted with the water cannon. Okay? And the roots then started proliferating, and they went laterally. So as the plants grew, at the bottom where the plants with the roots bent straight up, the roots kinked here, and as they came to the top and tried to restore geotropism and head back down again, which they never did for whatever reason, they kinked here at that surface level, and eventually, in about seven or eight years, this vineyard died, and they all just started collapsing very rapidly. It grew well into that point. It showed dramatic red leaf. They said, we have a horrible virus problem. You've got to come look at this. There was no virus. It was kinking. It was girdling. Now those plants girdled, girdled the color. Okay, so that, that vineyard died. It did some peculiar things first, though. As those roots went sideways, uh, they lost one of the things we say about grapevines. They don't produce shoots from, from, non, uh, from adventitious shoots, they do, from adventitious buds. They don't produce new shoots randomly along the length of a, of a stick or a root system, only from a node that had a dormant bud placed there before. And these plants started producing shoots all over the place just like you would if you mowed a mulberry tree root system. There'd be little mulberry trees growing all over your backyard. These were doing that throughout the vineyard. Completely bizarre because of the distribution of hormones. They were kinked through those two places and altered the, the whole uh, balance of these hormones. So this was a pretty bizarre site. And here's one that a student brought in to me very sadly once after, after leaving and coming back. Uh, and here was a potted vine. Potted vines are tricky. If you're going to plant dormant, Planted uh, potted vines, you should cut the roots off. And I'm not being facetious. You should trim them back really tight. All that effort is in the pot. You should trim them back tight and plant them that way because they kink up very readily. And again, that kinking and the damage from the kinking doesn't show up very quickly. It takes many, many years. And then suddenly they collapse. Uh, and you go back and you pull the plants up. And here's a root system that coiled around itself, bent half a dozen times, and finally was, was damaged because it sat in the pot too long or because you didn't trim those roots back off that potted dormant plant that should have been pruned back. Okay. Key. Uh, so these are the things that really make, have a big impact. Rootstock choice has some impact. You can make some, some big mistakes, but generally you can overcome them. But planting the plants properly uh, as often goes back to complaints about this rootstock being bad or that rootstock being bad or not performing properly, when in fact it wasn't really planted properly oftentimes. OK. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Any questions? I know it's your break time. I apologize for going a little longer. I did that so, so Larry and Con wouldn't have to get muddy this afternoon in the, in the backhoe pit. Uh -huh. Can you give some examples of uh, establishing your root systems, practices, and Ah, so the roots need to go down. It's just exactly like planting a nice garden plant. Uh, you've got to take it out of the pot. You've got to shake those roots loose. You've got to straighten them out. If, they're, if there's obvious areas where they're circling, that should be trimmed and cut back. Uh, if, if they are dormant in, pot, in pots, uh, shaking them out and trimming them way back is not a bad idea at all. And I wasn't being facetious. Cut the roots off is important. Let them regenerate from that. That's, that's how you would plant an old uh, dormant rootstock in, in the old days, right? We kept those root systems way back. There are two practices now from the nursery level. Some of them give you plants with all sorts of roots. Some give you plants with very trim back roots. Uh, the ones I would want would be the trim back roots, and then I'd cut those back again. But I'd like to see the whole root system, too, because it gives you some guarantee that we're well-grown and they look decent. But if you plant it with that massive root system and you discourage the roots from going deep, more deeply and having them flatten out or go up, then you're going to be in trouble with those, those scenarios. What do you mean by cut way back? Right. It could be literally an inch, an inch. depending on the, how, how they were potted. They're going to regrow anyway. What you want to get away from is that root that started going round or started going up or been kinked and bent a little bit. 
and leaving it in place because then it goes back to that last picture over many years, that, that place at which they're bent kinks and actually girdles the activity and development. Maybe even more than that. You know why? Because then you avoid that problem. So if you take that root mass that's there in that pot, and you put the whole thing in the ground, and you're, getting, and you're paying 25 cents per plant, <laughs> 50%, 50 cents per plant to get it planted, uh, you're going to discourage the, the time needed to pull those roots apart. That's not going to happen. So if you could plant the, the whole root system in the ground and arrange it appropriately, I would encourage you to do that. If you can't, I would encourage you to trim them back so you can actually take the, you avoid that, that risk in the future. So the most activity in the soil is in the upper two feet, and, and that's where these shadow root plants live. And when you look at their rooting zone, they have a few roots that go very deeply. That's a funny thing. Well, I've had a lot of students work on, on quantifying the differences between rootstocks and ceilings in terms of rooting depth and how they develop, and it's incredibly hard to measure. So if you look at that root system, your eye says it integrates all the different angles and says there's a shallow one, there's a medium one, there's a deep one. And if you tell students, put them in three groups, shallow, medium, and deep, and give me plus or minuses, which would be a one, a three, and a five, and I'd use two for the one in between and four for the one in between, you get pretty good values. If they go carefully and meticulously and spend many hours and measure every single angle of those roots, compile them all, there's no difference amongst the rootstocks because they all have shallow roots, they all have deep roots. It becomes a preponderance of them. So the deep root systems you'll see tend, tend to have very few lateral and very few branching roots, very few of the thin fibrous roots near the surface, and the shallow ones have all those in the surface. The deep ones go more or less straight down predominantly. No. Yes and no. Okay. okay. So in a deep soil with lots of water, all, again, the roots, the plant growth is very similar. The root system still has some differences, mainly in the predominance of these big sinker roots that form that are thumb size that get down very quickly into the soil. Uh, but it's, it, it's different. Um, if, if you don't irrigate well or extensively or you cut them way back intentionally, you're going to have flatter roots in general. Uh, but the roots you want for a drought adapted plant are the deep ones. You want to get them down, have them in that area where they can, they can moderate growth more effectively too. I'm not answering your question. You have that look in your eyes. It's, it's a deep question. Well rooted. <laughs> Yep. Um, it, it has to be a bad idea, but I haven't seen examples of it. <laughs> and we do the same thing in the North Coast. They do the same thing everywhere. So we pull in the fall now and we plant in the spring as quickly as possible. It's become sort of a mantra, uh, get, get these plants in the ground, get them going. And it's really a mistake. We should be leaving at least a year fallow if we could. Um, the other idea is that you can kill the root system. John Roncroni's not here to defend himself yet. He'll defend himself tomorrow maybe or whenever he's speaking to you. Um, you can't kill the root system. That you couldn't kill it up on that hillside in, in uh, uh, Chapelet, you can't do it elsewhere. You can kill the trunk. So when you plant an own rooted vine or uh, any grafted plant, the majority of what you put, put below ground is stem tissue. Right? You're putting the root system at the base of that stem, but the rest of it's a big piece of stem. That's not really root. You can kill that stem, but you can't kill the roots that radiate off of it. And they've been looking at a lot of different herbicides and treatment strategies and things. And John didn't believe me when I told him that because I went through with LIDAR many, many years ago as a graduate student saying, uh, uh, how can we kill these roots? Because that would be the answer to your question, right? If, if we want to go through very quickly and not leave them fallow and not, and not encourage the buildup of these pests, then we should kill all the roots uh, or remove them. And you can't remove them all because they penetrate too deeply. And you can't kill them because they penetrate too deeply. So um, it's a risk. And I, at least I would be changing rootstocks and making sure that you're using ones that, that have a different background over time and in the future. Uh, and it's a very common practice. It's, it's common up here, too, because we don't think of it the same way, but we're doing the exact same thing by pulling in the fall and planting in the spring right next to each other. Mm -hmm. So if you are going to replant with a different rootstock, why would you then leave it fallow? If you can't kill them, you can't. Why would you do that? So the soil itself, Gen uh, benefits from that fallow period. Yeah. Yeah. So, so not just the plant material, not just the nematode, but the whole soil complex, the whole mycoflora is going to change over time as well. It's just, it's just a good, a well-seasoned and time-practiced uh, 
or time time verified practice. I thought you were saying just from a, a root stock point of view, that you wouldn't need it for use, but yeah. Okay. No. I get yep. that. Yep. yep. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. First of all, they have phylloxera. Second of all, they are on very, very sandy soils. And phylloxera, we still don't know why, is discouraged on very sandy soils. In a container in the greenhouse, they do beautifully. In the field, you see very little damage. There was a site down in Ripon that I looked at many years ago. And uh, in, a, in, a, in a pebbles toss over a creek, the, the soil structure changed from sand to, allu to clay alluvium. And on the clay alluvium side, it was all unrooted. The clay alluvium side, it was dead from phylloxera. And the sandy side, right there, inches away, essentially, thriving. There was no evidence of a damage. There were phylloxera in the root systems, but not, not many. And no one knows why that's the case. So, so sandy soils are, are beneficial in that regard. Um, in, in eastern Washington, it's very cold, uh, extremely cold. And the vines die to the ground uh, occasionally, usually every five to eight years or so. And if they do, and they regenerate new shoots, you can retrain them, but they're rootstock, right? They're come from, from the ground, and they're from the protected parts of that ground. And that would be a root system. So they can't use rootstocks. They have to plant these own rooted sign, sign plants for that risk. Uh, and they haven't, they've had the luxury of not, not really encouraging the development of phloxera that might be more effective on sand yet. And, and uh, if I could prognosticate down the, down the 30 years from today, I would say, yeah, you're probably going to develop some different phloxera over time that might be more effective. It also goes back to that, that same thing I said originally where, where we traveled around Australia and talked to all the growers and I, was, and I would start my talks by saying, you people must be out of your minds. <laughs> In that region, they had no excuse, right? There was, they, they, they could have switched to rootstocks. They weren't worried about vine death if it, if it, if it, if it got that cold in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. It depends on your long-term goal, if then. And I think if you want to maintain a smaller plant, so there's this, there's this high vigor, low vigor, vine balance issue, and, and this idea that there are big plants and little plants. And, and there, it's true. And if you make a smaller plant, it's easier to manage uh, in many regards. It doesn't necessarily make better or worse fruit. That's up to, the, to, to you as a, as, a, as a grower. But you'll make a smaller plant, and it might be easier to, to, to regulate the crop entirely. Um, RS, RS3 and RS9 are two, Ramsey by Schwarzman, R for Ramsey, S for Schwarzman. They have uh, pretty good root knot nematode resistance and dagger nematode resistance. They don't have any fan leaf resistance. Um, they seem to slow down the speed at which they pick up fan leaf, but in most sites that we've looked at, it, it hasn't really stopped it. Um, in a few sites that Rhonda Smith and I have been looking at, it's in, they're incredibly low vigor, both of them. But RS3 is supposed to be the low vigor one and RS9 the high vigor, no, vice versa. RS3 the high vigor one and RS9 the lower vigor one. And they behave a lot like Schwarzman. The Schwarzman would be a good example, I think, here for, from what I've seen. Uh, they were thought to be a little bit more vigorous than other spots. Uh-huh. Usually, but not always. So, so a lot of that foliage that develops is wasted. It's, 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 it's again, this balance of the, of the vine and how it grows and develops. So you could, you could possibly regulate a shoot growth more effectively with a rootstock. And in general, though, you're going to reduce crop. It'll be, it'll be lo lo lighter weight. Uh, 